Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Iman Turki uh, from the Health Promotion Department in the Supreme Council for Family Affairs. We are delighted today to have Professor Nabid Ahmed Khan as a speaker for our uh, webinar for today. Dr. Nabid is going to talk about uh, safe wudu and brain infection. Uh, Dr. Navid Khan, he is a professor from the medical microbiology from the University of Sharjah. Uh, welcome, Dr. Navid, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and it's really it's a pleasure to 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 give this presentation. Uh, basically, the reason of um, selecting this topic is that recently we have been seeing. Um, somewhat of a new parasite which seems to be entering um, in our water supplies and uh, especially uh, considering the potential danger and lack of treatment that we have i think it's important that our community is familiar with this particular parasite just to avoid any any problems and complication so uh, what i've done is i've divided my talk in two parts so first uh, this emerging threat to the community i want to kind of make our community aware of this problem uh, so they can protect themselves and their loved ones and secondly i want to kind of highlight what are we doing about it in the, the university of sharjah in trying to come up with solutions or treatment methods to, to counter this potential threat that we have. Um, so basically the name of the parasite is, um, uh, is the easiest way to remember it is, is known as brain eating amoeba. And uh, the scientific name is Negleria fowleri. But just for the simplicity, I will refer to this parasite as brain eating amoeba. The reason it is called as brain-eating amoeba because it is known to get into the brain and then start causing infection of the brain. And that's why it's known as brain-eating amoeba. The major problem that we have uh, about this parasite is that if you get it, um, you will die. Uh, unfortunately, there is lack of treatment method uh, there is lack of um, drugs that can uh, access the brain easily and then treat this infection. And because of that, in most of the countries, except the, the, in the U.S., the mortality rate or the people who die because of this infection, if they get it, there's more than 90% of chance that they will die because of this parasite. In other countries uh, like India, Pakistan, South Asia, and many other countries, the, the it is almost 100% uh, lethal. So if somebody gets it, they will die. So it's very, very important um, that we are aware of this. So the way that it enters in our body is through the nose. So when we uh, bathe or when we do um, jump in, the, in a pool, or uh, when we do nasal irrigation uh, or even wuzul. So we are a, uh, largely a Muslim country and many of the other Muslim country. If sometimes uh, the water that we use uh, for nasal irrigation or nasal cleansing, if that water is not clean and, and it has uh, this parasite, then this parasite will enter the nose and it has a sticky surface on the surface of the parasite. So it kind of latches on or bind to the nose um, uh, inside tissue. And then it slowly move up like a crawling movement and then crawls and get into the brain. And as I mentioned that um, even if the, if the person is diagnosed, if the person goes to the hospital because of stiff neck or because of fever or, or some of the other symptoms that we see, even if uh, the, this parasite is identified in a hospital, that this person is infected because of this brain-eating amoeba, even then, person is likely, more than 90% chance that they will likely to die because of this parasite, because there's just no treatment method available uh, to, to cure or to treat this infection. So it's very, very important. So because of this, uh, this uh, nasal entry, uh, in addition, so wuzu is not just one, uh, 
the only way that it gets into the nose, but other um, uh, sports or other um, uh, habits in which we, uh, even bathing or jumping in a pool, any kind of activity that involves water into the nose, and if water is not clean, can potentially expose those people to contract these parasites. It's very, very important that in our swimming pools or, or, or any water features that we use, uh, that we, we, we chlorinate that water properly to ensure that we kill and eradicate and these pathogens before they have a chance to infect us. So I was interested in that to find out. So like a country, um, when, I, 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 when I was at the Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi, uh, so in here we used to see patients about, it's, it's a fairly pricey, expensive hospital in Pakistan, in Karachi, it's a small private hospital. And we used to see about 15 to 20 people uh, um, infected or die uh, from this parasite. And interestingly, uh, the none of the people that we used to see in the hospital, they had any history of swimming in fresh water or lakes or canal. So they were not swimming. Um, the, and, uh, you know, they were rarely used any swimming pools as well. Uh, but in, uh, Karachi is a, is a large city. It's very cosmopolitan, the different um, ethnicities, uh, the Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, largely Muslim. But interestingly, all the infection we used to see all those people were uh, always Muslims. Um, and 90% of them were young males between 18 years old and 35 years old. So the, hence we, we established this link that it is likely that people are getting this infection because of the ablution practice, because the way that they were cleansing their nose and maybe they do not have access to maybe very clean, uh, to clean water. And that's what's uh, causing this infection. And mostly young males, they are, sometimes they can be very aggressive in their nasal um, cleansing, and that could also create this uh, uh, in contracting this particular parasite. So if our question was that if the situation is that bad in a, in a private hospital, which is very expensive, and so you can imagine the, that in the public hospital, the, the situation must be very very damaging, very devastating. So we ought to be creating awareness because of lack uh, lack of successful treatment. Uh, it is important that public is aware of this uh, this parasite so they can be more cautious, more careful, especially when they do nasal irrigation. And as you can imagine, this is a sensitive topic. Uh, being a Muslim myself, it is not easy. You can't just go out and tell people not to do ablution or not to do wazoo, right? It's a part of our life. Uh, so we had to take care of this issue in a very sensitive manner. So the message is not to say that we should not do wazoo or nasal irrigation. What we are saying is that we ought to be more cautious. We need to encourage people to use clean water if they can. Uh, sometimes they don't have access. Uh, and in that case, if they're not sure about the water cleansiness, then they need to be a bit more cautious when they're pushing water uh, up their nose, which may have this parasite. So these are the mechanism by which uh, this parasite can get into the nose. So it's not just the ablution or wazoo practice, but also swimming in contaminated water. It can be some time to just to clear sinuses. People use also nasal irrigation, but these water pots, one ought to be sure that these water pots contain water, which is relatively clean, um, so it's not, uh, does not contain any of these parasites or bacteria and so on, so we need to be ensured. So what we did was that, again, uh, we went to the to the public health authorities to try to create awareness, and so we went around even to the mosque, because, you know, in Karachi, so mosque, like in here as well, in, in some of the, the places, so they have rooftop uh, top tanks, or underground uh, tanks as well to store water because water is uh, is is very is is pricey, it's expensive, and getting clean water is not easy. So you can you can see that these are the kind of uh, uh, tanks which uh, storage tanks which are used to store water, and then people use it. 
So when we surveyed some of these tanks, so you can see the kind of, uh, I don't know whether you can see the, the, the my cursor here. You can see these are the underground tanks and you can see all um, these kind of, uh, um, you can see these kind of lizards in, in the storage tank. So you can imagine that if these kind of uh, organisms are present in these water storage tank, then um, it, uh, it is possible that some, some of these people who do not have access to chlorinate wa uh, clean water, they may not uh, chlorinate water properly. That leads to uh, contamination by bacteria and parasite and also some of the other organism. And that's uh, in a way it's kind of true because you know how often people chlorinate. If you have a rooftop top tank, storage tank or underground tank, how often you're going to put chlorine because you need to be sure that how much chlorine you put in. You don't want to put, put too much chlorine because that can also be damaging for your health and for the environment and for your skin and so on. So there are multiple challenges that we need to make sure. So we, we again, we try to create awareness among the health officials so that uh, something ought to be done about it. Not sure why the slide is not moving. Need some help on this. Can somebody? Yes, doctor. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't seem to move the slide. Can you? Um, you can. Can you stop share and share again, maybe? Okay. Just come a drop down list on the top of the screen. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right. So what we did was um, uh, we uh, went to, to just to find out that what is the situation in the rest of the country. So we went to other regions uh, within the country. And this is a small canal in the middle of the city near Lahore. And in the summer months, you can see how many people are swimming in this canal. And there are thousands of them because some are very hot months and people, you know, sometimes they just just to cool off, they jump in, in this small canal. This is fresh water and um, yeah, there are just thousands of people just swimming there. So again, my question to the health authority was that how do we know where are the toilet facility? How do we, do we know whether this water is clean? Uh, we need to ensure that public is aware of these not only just this this particular parasite, but also other pathogens which may be present in this water, we ought to be. So sometimes, you know, people uh, can get infected and uh, they can, it can cause serious uh, health implication. So if you keep uh, going through the city and this, this uh, small canal, it goes through the city. So you can see again, large number of people um, um, swimming in, in there and uh, without, our complete understanding of whether this water is clean, whether it contains any of these bugs, which may be, uh, which they may be exposed to. Um, so again, they are uh, uh, having fun and in, in, uh, in these waters for, for playing activities and so on without the knowledge of some of these problems that we are facing. Uh, so if you keep going further down the, the this canal, you see again in village areas, these, um, some of these kids swimming. Um, this kid is smart. He's holding his nose and closing it before jumping in. This kid is not so smart. He's jumping face down, which suggests that uh, water can, you know, enter the nose. And if, if this water is contaminated, that can cause problem because then it may get into the nose and then uh, to the brain. Again, uh, when you go towards the, the rural areas, uh, again, you see kids um, swimming there and uh, again, uh, potentially exposing themselves to some of these pathogens. So something ought to be, there has to be more awareness. Uh, again, some of the other images are showing a similar kind of uh, phenomena that uh, people using um, these uh, waters, this fresh water for swimming, for bathing and for fun but without realizing and we never 
you know, we encourage public health authorities to have some signage to ensure that people are aware of it. And there has to be some facilities to ensure that this water is. Is clean and not just in in those in, in Pakistan, but also when you think about them, and this is uh, uh, the, the practice in uh, Ganges River with the more than you know 20 million people gathered every year for ritual bathing. And again, similar kind of phenomena. How do we know whether this water is clean or whether people can contract these parasites? So again, all these people, more than 10 million people gathering in one place and with the sole purpose for, of ritual bathing. Um, and they have to, so they can potentially expose to not just to this brain eating amoeba, but also to other potential pathogens, which may be present in these waters. So there ought to be signage, there ought to be awareness about these, uh, these parasites. So the question is, and, and that, and uh, again, we, we are within the UAE, again, we are, uh, is, um, the weather is fairly hot and people use uh, swimming, uh, they go to the beach, they go to a swimming pool and so on. And also that we are largely Muslim population. So people again do wazoo as well. So there is a possibility that if there is this parasite and uh, people are not sure about the water, uh, that they are being exposed to, then this can cause problem, especially when it comes to these parasites. So the key question is that sometime when you get these infection and you go to the hospital, you get these antibiotics and antibiotics are fairly powerful because they are able to treat these infection fairly easily. So why this particular parasite is so difficult to treat uh, and uh, the mortality, um, the death rate is almost 100%. So why is it so difficult to treat? And the reason is that uh, most of the antibiotic that you see in a pharmacy, they are small molecule. So they have the ability to get through the blood and into the brain and kill those pathogens. But to kill this parasite, these parasites are large. So the small molecule, which are antibiotic molecule, they are unable to kill these parasites. So we really need to have large molecule to kill these parasites. So basically different kinds of drugs. And these different kinds of drugs, because they're very large molecule, uh, it is very hard for these molecules to get through the blood and into the brain. And its lack of access into the brain is what uh, makes it so difficult. So because drugs cannot penetrate, cannot easily go into the brain, that makes it very challenging to treat. Because unless this drug gets into the brain where the parasite is sitting, then we are not able to kill it. And unless we kill it, we are not going to cure that patient. So this parasite need, need to be killed using drugs. But how do we get these drugs into the, into the brain where this parasite is sitting? Because these drugs are very large, large molecule or large drugs, which find it difficult to access the brain, difficult to cross the blood vessel and uh, access the brain. So that makes it more more tricky, more challenging. So that's why this infection is so difficult. Um, yeah, in here, um, I don't want to go into detail, but basically what, all I'm trying to say is that um, uh, our brain is protected by uh, these very um, uh, selective barriers. So, so nothing, uh, not everything can easily cross these barriers and access the brain. So our brain is generally very well protected. And that's why we find it difficult to come up with new drugs, uh, which can cross the, these barriers and access the brain, especially large molecule. A small molecule like antibiotics that you see in a pharmacy, they can get through easily. They can sneak in through the barrier. But to kill this parasite, we need to have these large molecule, large drug. So the question is that how does amoeba, how does this brain eating parasite, how do they get into the brain? So they, uh, interestingly, so this parasite is, um, has uh, developed a mechanism where it does not go through the blood. So if it goes through the blood, then of course it can, it also cannot cross this barrier and get to the brain. Uh, but it uses a completely different mechanism. So it uses a nasal route. Uh, so it goes through the nose and nose is very well connected straight to the brain. So instead of using the blood, and blood vessels and all those challenging route, it uses this very simple and very 
um, a straightforward route to get to the brain, which is enter the nose and slowly nose is linked with the with the brain. So it doesn't have to go into the blood. It doesn't have to cross any barrier. It can go directly into the brain and cause the infection. So that makes it uh, more uh, for the parasite uh, makes it easier for the parasite to get into the into the brain. So what we have suggested and we're still working on on this is that. If the parasite is using the, the nose to enter the brain, why are we using drugs into the blood? So, if the parasite is using the nose to get to the brain, we should also use the nose to get to the brain for the drug. So, that will make more sense because we can just simply follow the same path that parasite is using to access the parasite, to reach the parasite, to kill the parasite. So, it does not make sense that um, uh, if the parasite is using the nasal route and we are using the blood route, we inject intravenous injection of, of the drug, which makes it very tricky because the drug has to go to the liver, to all the tissues and then cross the barriers and then into the brain. So we should also be thinking about using the nose to then um, um, uh, to, to inject drugs so that uh, we can follow the same pathway that parasite is using to to kill the uh, to affect the brain so that's a pathway that we are using i don't want to go into the detail for for this uh, this slide but basically we are trying to uh, create awareness and we're looking at the problem which we feel is because of global warming there will be increased activities outdoor activities by the public which means that people will use more swimming pools and, you know, uh, for uh, water related activities and there will be, and also, especially for developing countries, especially for countries that is large Muslim population who do regular wazoo, then it's important that they are to be aware of this problem because that's the prevention is the best way to stop this infection. However, some people who do get this, uh, infection we ought to be looking at the drug discovery side that how can we come up with new drugs some interesting new molecule that can cross these barriers that can cross the blood vessel and um, access the brain and then kill the parasite and finally we in our lab we are looking at the drug delivery because coming up with a new drug is one uh, part of our work but we also need to make sure that this drug we are able to deliver to the target site, to the brain site, so that we can effectively kill the parasite. And that uh, remains uh, a challenge for us to find out new drugs that we can deliver. We're using nanotechnology and other methodology where we can effectively deliver these drugs to the brain tissue to um, uh, stop this, uh, to treat this infection. Uh, now, I, I want to switch uh, my talk uh, related to this, uh, that how can we come up with new sources of antimicrobials or new drug? How can we, uh, what are the other things that we, we ought to be looking at? So, when you think about drugs, you think about pharma, pharmaceutical industry, you think about chemistry and so on. But we are looking at a slightly other angle to come up with new, new types of uh, drugs from different sources. And... Uh, so why do we need to do that? Because of this parasite, because of other infections um, that we ought to be looking for novel sources, new sources of drugs as well. Uh, and that's important. Uh, and uh, other reasons that we, we need to be looking for new drugs is because every day we hear in the news that there's a new superbugs, there's a new, you know, there's COVID-19, there's a new infection. So that means that we ought to be looking for new drugs all the time because those new drugs hopefully can allow us to stay a step ahead of these infection and try to, to save patients' life. And also another reason is that the, in, in recent years, there has been decline in the number of new drugs. So in, here, in this slide, you see that in 1983 to 1987, there were 16 new drugs which were approved by the FDA in the USA. And in the next five years, there are only 14 and the next five years and 10. And this trend is continuing. So there's only, you know, one or two or three new drugs which have been approved in, in the last few years. And uh, also, um, I don't know why I put this slide, but <laughs> I think probably just to highlight the zoonotic infection, you know, like uh, there's a lot of this uh, uh, 
uh, hypothesis that the coronavirus has, has jumped from the bat to the humans. So, these zoonotic infection where animals or other birds or other animals, they can transmit infections from them to humans, which can cause additional problems as well. So, we ought to be keeping an eye on that. So, regarding this, um, again, this is my family. The, so, these two kids in, on the front, is um, uh, this is Salahuddin and this is Muhammad. This is my little daughter, Iman, and this is my wife, Rukhaya. So, so, when we had uh, kids and uh, so, you, we had a lot of, you know, colleagues who gave us uh, these books. They said, you know, you ought to be really protecting your kids against all these germs that you see and you need to make sure they wash their hands and the, with antibacterial soaps and and all these disinfectants and all that to really make sure you protect your kids. And that's where, where we came up with this interesting question that, you know, we are protecting our kids all the time and telling them to wash their hands and make sure they're clean and, and all that and wearing masks nowadays and, and everything. But what about other animals, other species, you know, scientifically speaking, that there are other animals who do not wash their hands and they do not wear masks and they do not protect themselves and, and all that. How are they protected? So things like cockroaches, then how do they survive in those uh, unhygienic environment? You know, cockroaches, they live in gutters and yet they thrive. They are, they're happy. They have a very large population. It doesn't matter how many insect repellents you use and how many insecticide you use, you can't seem to get rid of these things, these bugs suggesting that they must be very powerful in defending their species, in defending themselves against all these germs. So, um, coronavirus is a, is a huge concern for homo sapiens, for humans. But why doesn't coronavirus is affecting the population of um, cockroaches or um, rodents, rats, and, and so on? So, we ought to be looking at these species as well to find out that how are they protected? Maybe they have something in them. Maybe they have some drugs in them, which we, or molecules in them, which we need to isolate and we need to use it for our benefit. Maybe we need to learn from them how they evolve, how they adapt, how do they counter such threats and uh, not only focusing on chemistry and new drugs, but also learning from other species to find out how do they do this so that we can use similar mechanisms for our species, for our kids, and, and so on. So, um, uh, you know, cockroaches, they are one of the most hated insects in the world, uh, which is sad because they have so much to teach us. You know, they, are, uh, the, they have so many interesting features about them. They are one of the hardiest insects on this planet. They can survive without food for more than a month, uh, unimaginable. They can survive without air for more than 45 minutes. They can remain submerged underwater for more than 30 minutes without dying. They can resist the radiation level 15 times more than what can kill us. So if they're exposed to x-rays and so on radiation, they can survive um, radiation level which uh, 15 times more what can kill us. They are one of the only species that can survive nuclear um, uh, blasts and so on. So, and they've been here for more than 350 million years ago. So, very, very long time. And how long ago we came on this planet? We've been here, the fossil record suggests that we've been here for maybe 70,000 years or 100,000 years, but they have been here for more than 350 million years. That's a very, very long time. And they have seen everything. All those eras and all those, um, um, so survived all those events. So, suggesting that they know how to evolve, they know how to adapt on this planet. So, we ought to be learning from them that how do they do that and hopefully we can use some of their mechanisms for our benefit as well. So, you know, when people talk about that, which species is going to inherit this planet from humans, from us, so people talk about viruses that they will inherit the planet from, from us or superbugs. I believe that cockroaches are also, you know, another species that we need to watch out for because they can also survive very tough condition, suggesting we ought to be learning from them. Uh, same thing for locusts. Uh, they're also interesting species. I don't want to go into detail here, but they're also uh, interesting species that cause so much devastation and famine. And uh, again, 
they can survive in, um, in, in different environments. At the time, I was working with the Ministry of Defense in the UK, and we were seeing a lot of patients who were, uh, we were unable to treat in the hospital. And um, again, posing this question that if humans are getting infections or getting problems, why don't these species get similar problem? Why don't they become extinct? And we keep talking about that humans, this planet will become very difficult to live on and is challenging environment and so on and so forth. So we ought to be learning from these species. So we started looking in our lab, started looking at things like cockroaches and locusts to find out they may have some very powerful molecules, very powerful drugs that we need to, uh, to take from them and use them for humans. And so we, we grow these cockroaches. It is very difficult to find people who, who want to touch cockroaches or work with them. So basically we have to do dissections and pull out these molecules and, and in our labs and try to find out that uh, how can we use them. So we collect their blood. Uh, it's known as hemolymph. So we collect blood from these insects. We collect their uh, fat bodies, their muscles, uh, and we collect their brains. This is what the brain of a locust looks like. We dissect them. Uh, this is a bilobe brain, which is of, of a locust. So we try to then pull out this molecule from them. Then similar strategy we use for other insects as well. Try to find out that how we can pull out this molecule. So we tested these um, their brain lysates of cockroaches against uh, MRSA. MRSA is like a superbug. It's a huge problem uh, for especially for hospital acquired infection. Um, it basically uh, is known as a, as a major superbug where people get infected and it can cause a serious complications. So we tested the brain lysates of, uh, of cockroaches against MRSA, the superbug, this bacteria. And interestingly, we, what we found was that uh, uh, the cockroach brain killed all the superbugs, uh, more than a million superbugs, suggesting that they do have some very powerful drugs some very powerful molecule to kill the superbug, which means that we need to identify these drugs and then bring them to a pharmacy, bring them to a market. Uh, uh, so this work was highlighted in, in Science News, uh, uh, and this work was uh, highlighted in New Scientist, which, which is a UK-based magazine. BBC crew, uh, they came to our lab just to film. They were interested that we are working on cockroach brain and they can be a sort of antibiotic to fight MRSA or to fight um, these bugs. So they were very interested that why are we doing it and how are we doing it and so on. And they asked this interesting question that are we suggesting that we should have cockroach farms to then treat people and so on. So that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that um, uh, we need to isolate these drugs from them and then uh, uh, synthesize them make more of this drug in a lab environment than just like insulin or any other uh, other drugs and then try and use it for for human benefit for our for infection for, for treating infection and many other agencies they were interested in this work and our my hope is that uh, finally cockroaches will find their way into the affection of the human race so you know when you see them anywhere uh, don't step on them <laughs> just uh, uh, catch them and bring them to our lab at the University of Sharjah so we can um, uh, make it useful and try to again use them for um, uh, for our for our research. Um, and I don't want to go into detail here. In here, the take home message is simply that when we tested these drugs, we wanted to find out are these these um, drugs from cockroaches and so on they're safe for human cells or not? They're safe for us or not? So we put them on human cells and they did not do any damage to human cells, but they only kill bacteria or the superbugs, suggesting they're safe for, uh, against human cells, but uh, they were able to, to kill 100% uh, of these uh, superbugs that we use. And so far we have identified, so there we, from the cockroach brain, we have um, identified more than 200 types of different kinds of molecules. And out of these 200 molecules, we have identified 20 of them. And then we are working with individual molecule to find out that whether these uh, molecules work uh, alone or in combination with each other to then to kill the, the superbugs. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. 
I will be happy to answer any questions later on. This is just last couple of slides. So now we have expanded our um, hypothesis, our research, that why should we limit our work or our discovery of new drugs? Just for cockroaches or locusts, we should also look at other animals that live in polluted environment, in difficult environment, in challenging environment, in unhygienic environment, and then try to find out that how do they cope? How do they counter these infections, these problems? And we can learn. So things like um, snakes. Snakes eat rat. And we all know that rat are um, germ infested, right? We cannot imagine eating live rats, and not even cooked rat. Why? Because there's a repulsion. We feel that uh, rats are dirty, they have germs, they have bugs on them. That's why we have that evolutionary, this repulsion against them. And uh, also they're not halal, I think. <laughs> so there are many reasons not to eat them. Uh, but things like snakes, they eat live rats, which means that these live rats, with, uh, these snakes will be exposed to those uh, germ infested environment, these germs within these rats. But these snakes, they thrive. Um, they they like it and they, they they're happy with that. So suggesting that these snakes must have some very powerful molecule, um, um, and, and when we tested that, because originally people thought that maybe it's in their venom that there's something which is antibacterial I mean, they haven't drug, but snake venom has nothing to do with the antibacterial antiviral properties. It has nothing like that. So there are other molecules which are actually at work which we need to isolate and, and identify. Same thing for crocodile. Uh, crocodile, um, uh, they are very interesting species and uh, they, 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 they can eat rotten meat and uh, they fight and their wounds are uh, healed very quickly without the use of antibiotics, without the use of uh, any drugs. And if they can feed on rotten meat, which is gooey and, and yellowish, and yet they can thrive on that, suggesting that, again that they must have some very interesting powerful drugs in them that we need to to take it out and use it for our benefit for human consumption so uh, crocodile we were interested in that um this very they, the crocodile live almost 100 years so it's not like they have a short lifespan a very long lifespan they don't get cancer and they uh, they, they, they they're very hard to get any infection and they can, you know, they can eat rotten meat. You know, my mother cooks me chicken curry and they cooks it to death, so putting all the spices and everything. So you can imagine that um, be yet they can uh, eat rotten meat and, and yet they thrive. And uh, so we went to the crocodile um, farm and collected a, a, a species. And this is a meat which is uh, fed to these crocodile. And you can see that this is hardened fully contaminated meat and um, sorry to spoil your lunch, but I just want to really highlight and the kind of water they're exposed to. So we worry about swimming in fresh water, which may be contaminated and all that, but crocodile, they're always in the, in this kind of water, which is, uh, which has heavy metals, which have parasites, which have bacteria and the meat are full of contaminants, full of superbugs, full of all these bacteria and parasites. And yet, when crocodiles eat them, they can thrive and they're happy and they're, they can live a very long life without even getting cancer. Suggesting we ought to be learning from crocodile. Have they been here for how many years? More than 300 million years. We've been here for a very short time. And so we ought to be learning from other species. So these are the crocodiles. So we, these are our, some of our researchers who are very brave. And so they, they collected this crocodile specimen. Uh, we brought it into our lab and uh, uh, together with the team Crocodile Dundee to make sure that we don't have any incident at the university. And then we dissected this crocodile. Um, again, you, you know, this was a 14 feet long crocodile. And you can imagine the kind of meat that you get. We really wanted to have a crocodile barbecue. <laughs> but uh, then my mother called me and she said it's not halal. So we unfortunately did not take advantage of that. But anyway, so we collected their specimens and then again, using similar research, we try to find out that what are the molecules, what are the drugs which are present in this crocodile, and then we are testing them against different kind of bacteria, viruses, parasites, try to come up with new, new molecules, new drugs that we can use for our 
for human benefit. So this is our team, uh, my team at the university, and uh, who are this is Professor Rukeya Siddiqui, who's also part of this team, and uh, we're also training. Um, uh, Okay, we're building capacity, and this is these are two of my kids, Muhammad and Saladin, and they're very brave. They're always interested in working with various species and, and trying to learn. Uh, so hopefully they can also continue this work as well. So um, I okay, I don't want to go into too much there. Just very quickly, just want to say that we're also working on black cobra, which is a, a interesting species to look at, and. Uh, so we, we collect their venom uh, of black cobra, uh, and then we again do similar kind of work. We dissect it out, we collect their organs, then we find out what molecules, what potential drugs that they, it may have. Uh, this is the anatomy of uh, black cobra. Uh, we collect his blood as well to find out maybe they have something in the blood, which is very powerful, which can protect them against getting infected. We collect the heart, lungs, liver, very well, similar kind of research that we've done with crocodile and kidneys, intestine, and so on. And then we test them against E. coli, or Pseudomonas, or Streptococcus pneumonia, or MRSA, or other superbugs to find out that against which bacteria or which parasites or bugs that they are effective against, and then try to find out what is that, that drug or combination of that drug that we use. Okay. So the, the, the source of these uh, antibacterial molecules that we were looking at we believe that there are two sources from these animal. One, which is the immune system, which is the tissue or the blood and so on. And secondly, the potentially the gut bacteria of these cockroaches and crocodile and, and, and cobra and so on. So we're looking at both. So we're pulling out the immune system and we're also looking at the gut bacteria of these species to find out what type of molecules are produced by these uh, bacteria, by, by these gut bacteria so that we can isolate them and then uh, test them against other pa uh, parasites in the in the community that we see. So that's the type of research that we do. So that's just one part. So of course, we are interested in um, in other species, which uh, I'm relatively new to the UAE. Uh, so I'm uh, interested in looking at yes, other local other species. Local... Okay, uh, just last uh, one, one one minute. Yeah. I just hear some okay. echo. Okay. So, uh, just the last, um, uh, just the last couple of slides. So, basically, we are interested in uh, other local species that we, may be relevant to the local community here, like scorpions, I hear, or vultures, or eagles, or crows. Crows is a very interesting species. Again, they live in unhygienic condition. They eat those, those um, uh, the unhygienic material, organic material. So we ought to be looking at that. Also, um, uh, vertebrates and invertebrates from the coastal areas, uh, birds captured from garbage dumping areas like crows, we ought to be looking at them to find out how do they survive? Why don't they get infected? And similarly about uh, lizards, snakes, frogs, uh, other pests as well. And uh, other, uh, other small uh, animals within this, uh, which live in this unhygienic environment, we ought to be looking at them to find out that how do they survive, how do they thrive in these conditions, try to understand, and then try to pull out those drugs from those, and why, uh, from those animals, those species, and then bring them to a pharmacy for, for human use. So that's the type of the work that we are doing. So in the end, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful again to the University of Sharjah, who are uh, where we do a majority of this work. I also collaborate with the American University of Sharjah, with Professor Rukeya Siddiqui, and other colleagues from uh, different universities from the UK, USA, and Karachi, who are supporting this work. And we are thankful again to uh, different agencies to, to fund this research, and hopefully uh, uh, we can bring some of these drugs to a pharmacy um, near you. Uh, most importantly, we are thankful to these teachers who have contributed their life to this work, and uh, our hope is really to one day bring some of these drugs uh, for, for human use to protect our lives. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And Thank this you, work... Doctor, for your... Uh... Uh, for your for the information given in today's lecture
I hope uh, that everyone enjoyed the new information. It might not be relevant to the UAE because we have a very good water sanitation over here. Yeah, yeah, you're right, absolutely. So we were very fortunate that we have uh, clean water supplies and so on. Um, so it's important to be aware of this this uh, this problem uh, because uh, there could be uh, scenarios where water is stored in tanks for long term storage. And uh, so it's just something to be aware of. So hopefully we will not have this problem in the UAE at all. Yes, I do agree with you, uh, Professor. Uh, it, it works with regular uh, cleaning for the water tanks, and even uh, we are uh, people who are lo in love with traveling. So maybe even during our uh, trips uh, abroad, tra traveling in those places which we are not sure of the quality of the water, we should be uh, cautioned with the use of water. As you said, uh, Professor, I do believe that. Um, and uh, I hope that everyone got the uh, information and enjoyed uh, today's uh, webinar. I do appreciate your your time, uh, Doctor. Uh, for everybody, please, there is a link for evaluation in the chat box. Uh, I appreciate your time in filling the evaluation form for us. And uh, hopefully, if there is any questions or uh, regarding the uh, brain infections and uh, uh, water sanitation for uh, for the professor. Please go ahead and uh, give us your question. Uh, Raya, I believe you have uh, you raised your hand. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, this uh, topic. It's uh, very important, and uh, I believe maybe the screen uh, we start maybe uh, start screening our water to make sure. If we really have this uh, Nigeria in our uh, uh, water or not, especially maybe randomly in uh, some houses. Uh, also, I would like to ask if there is any uh, test that uh, can detect it, uh, detect this kind of parasite, so we can use it in uh, in the hospital. Sometime we have some patient. Uh, came with the meningitis. We did the screening for many uh, for uh, the common test that we have it, but it gave us a negative result. So I believe maybe uh, if we introduce this test to our uh, hospital, uh, maybe it will give us uh, some answer. Yeah. Well, the, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is an excellent point. Both points. First of all, let me thank the host. Because she mentioned a very good point that it's not just within this country, but also when we go outside. So that's a very, very relevant point. I really like it. I'll probably include it in the next presentation. Yeah, so when we go for travel or visit another country, we ought to be cautious. So, so for you, Gaia, yes, you're absolutely right. I really like this comment that we ought to be. How do we know when something is not there unless we look for it, unless we make sure? So, yeah, there ought to be research. As far as I'm aware, there is at the moment uh, we... We, we 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 ought to be looking at water supplies, maybe randomly in different uh, parts of the of the country to make sure that our water is clean. So yeah, there's you know it, it, it should be done. So I agree. At the moment, I don't think, as far as I'm aware, it, it's being done. Uh, and the secondly, the very very important point that you mentioned is that majority, and this was happening, this was happening in Pakistan, that almost all infections where uh, they were not treated by antibiotic was still considered and labeled as uh, bacterial meningitis uh, without confirmation that whether it's parasitic or whether it's neglaria or braining or whatever. So, so uh, often, most often, 99% of the time, it is labeled, it's mislabeled as bacterial meningitis and that case is closed because all hospitals are required, even in, in all countries, they're required to report how many cases they saw of meningitis. And it was considered as bacterial meningitis. Uh, we do have a test in our um, at the University of Chicago in our lab where we can carry this out, and we will be more than happy to share that uh, with any hospital. Uh, but again, what we are hoping for is there ought to be awareness because unless we start looking for something, uh, sometimes we are not sure whether it's there or even if there is a one case, uh, if God forbid, if it happens, that we ought to be at least make sure that. Uh, 
that it's not because of this parasite or it is, then we need to be creating more awareness. So I agree with all those points, which are which are excellent and uh, which allow us to then then do further work to ensure that everybody is aware and we are fully prepared to counter or to 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 ensure safety of the public. I hope that makes sense. Claire. Yeah, I hope it will become uh, in one in our agenda in UAE to screen this uh, kind of the parasites or uh, bacteria. Uh, so it will be helpful that uh, we will know uh, if it is uh, there or not. It will yeah. answer many of our questions. Thank you again, Victor. Oh, thank you. And if anybody is interested in learning, if you, some of you who are working in a uh, or uh, affiliated in some way with the hospital. Uh, feel free to, you know, inform others that we have this, uh, this test, which is available in our lab and we'll be happy to then make sure this available for anybody who's interested in that. And hopefully with time, there'll be more research, especially regarding our water supplies. So prevention is still remains the best strategy. If we can stop the contracting this parasite, that's the easiest option. So that will be best. Yes, doctor, as you said, prevention is the best strategy. I do believe that and I do totally uh, strongly agree with you on this uh, matter. Uh, thank you, Dr. Navid, for your time and uh, for the uh, valuable information that you shared with us today. I hope everybody enjoyed and get uh, new information in this field. And uh, as Gaia said, we hope that this strategy, strategy can be adopted in the country to test these kind of parasites. In in case of there is in some in our houses, uh, we can we can say. So uh, I hope everybody. Uh, uh, if if, you, if there is any more questions before we uh, end our uh, meeting for today. Uh, as there is no any more uh, questions from the participants, uh, once more time, thank you, doctor, for your uh, time and uh, looking forward for future collaborations. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.